thank you all for joining us. Um, as David said, I'm currently the chair of the RUK Open Access Publishing Processes Group. Um, we've been in existence uh, for a few years now, um, before transformative agreements and their like came along. And we've been trying to work with publishers, not just on behalf of our UK members, but anyone really who's engaging with the publisher, particularly in the payment of, of an APC, um, to kind of help talk with publishers about what it is that institutions need when they pay an APC. So the metadata and funding information and so on that, that we find quite hard to get sometimes from publishers. Um, and also engaging with publishers about the types of messages that they're giving to authors in the in the APC workflow. Um, and we've been we've been doing that, like I say, for, for a number of years. Um, and there's there's more information about the group on the RUK uh, website. Um, the OA Switchboard is a project that some of you may have read about. I think um, it's been around as a concept for a couple of years, I think. Um, and um, started really in earnest um, earlier this year, and Yvonne is, is here really to tell us about it, but, but the, it is addressing very much part of the, of the OA publishing processes, as Yvonne and I were just talking about. Um, so um, the project is, is hoping to, to come up with a, a proof of concept, minimal viable product, uh, over this year. And uh, we wanted, therefore, to, to ask Yvonne to, to talk to people, particularly in the UK, about what the switchboard is um, and what it's hoping to do, um, and uh, I think invite people's engagement as well. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Yvonne to, uh, to take over the main part of, of the webinar. Great. Well, uh, thank you, Ruth and, and David and Melanie again for the opportunity to talk about the OA switchboard, which is indeed a neutral information exchange hub streamlining the communication between funders, institutions and publishers regarding OA publications. And as already mentioned, it's a very practical tool. It's a tool. Uh, I'll also show some demos and you'll see it's quite detailed administration back office yet with the potential to achieve a breakthrough in the transformation of the market such that open access is supported as the predominant model of publication. Uh, because the complexity and the administrative burden on institutions, funders and publishers has hindered progress in developing new business models to support a broader move to OA. And from a researcher perspective, the landscape is at best confusing and at worst impenetrable. And my name is Yvonne Kempfens. As said, I'm the project manager for the OA Switchboard and very happy uh, with the opportunity to present to you today. And maybe as a brief introduction, I'm an independent consultant and I'm doing this uh, project for, for this year. I have 25 years of experience in academic publishing and related uh, industries. And uh, in that time, I've been involved in a number of collaborative, large uh, industry-wide initiatives. And I'd like to mention the uh, transfer code of practice that more than 20 years ago, I think, or some 20 years ago, we started together with EdPens and others uh, to enable uh, the, the move of society journals from, from one publisher to the other. And the debate around what is competitive and what is not, and what can be shared and what you can do together was heated. So um, it, it's kind of a threat throughout my, uh, my years in uh, in the industry and I'm very pleased to be involved. Now for today I have a brief agenda. I would like to just at a glance look at what the switchboard is, then zoom into what the underlying problem is, how we see the solution and, and the value the OA switchboard will bring. Then we get more practical, how does it work? Also a little bit about the technology, but there's also a, an appendix in this PowerPoint deck. And if you really would like to talk technical details, I'm happy to organize a separate meeting also involving our, our technology partner uh, for that. Then I'll have a demo. I have a couple of uh, videos uh, to show you, hopefully to, to bring it to life so you see what it's all about. And we, there should be time for, uh, for discussion and, and Q&A. Um, I won't show it, but I want to mention it at this stage. I have, a, I have information about other industries because some other industries have tackled similar problems long time ago. And I'd like to mention the banking world to you. Maybe you know about SWIFT and that has been around for over 40 years and it's a secure financial messaging service. And it started with just four banks working together. And right now, 40 years later, the whole world is connected. And I'd like to mention that as an, as an example, 
example, to, uh, to show that it is possible uh, to collaborate, especially in, in the back office uh, space, uh, in infrastructure with different players and achieve uh, wonderful things that may not be visible at the surface, but uh, can benefit everybody. So in short, uh, David already mentioned it, but the OA Switchboard Initiative is a not-for-profit collaboration between funders, institutions and publishers. The Switchboard itself is a tool, it's a central information exchange hub connecting parties and systems and streamlining the neutral exchange of OA-related publication level information and ensuring a financial settlement can be done without getting involved in the actual financial transaction quite important to, to mention. The initiative is currently overseen by OESPA, but the ambition is uh, already for 2021, if, if um, uh, nothing impacted by, by Corona, hopefully, uh, but the planning is that for next year, we move to a sustainable governance structure and funding model uh, moving forward. And in a, in a nutshell, the timeline uh, indeed uh, for a couple of years, probably even before December 2018, I was not involved at that time, but in December 2018, there was an initial stakeholder meeting with various people involved. And, and on our website, you can see who were there right from the start, but it was publishers, funders, um, institutions, but also uh, Crossref and, and others. Then throughout 2019, talks, uh, some blogs, meetings, conferences, panel discussions, and the support for the concept was growing. In December last year I was appointed after an RFP process because they were looking for a consultant to get it off the ground. Dealing with the chicken and egg situation of, um, and I'm moving forward a little bit, jumping ahead, the ambition of having something in place where funders, institutions and publishers are equally represented and at the same time wanting to get started. That's why we're in a project uh, for 2020 and we're working hard towards this operational stage. Uh, for, for 2021 and beyond. This year, a lot has happened. Uh, a steering committee has been announced in January, amazing people uh, on there. And we were starting to get project funding sponsorship to get through this first year. An advisory group uh, was put in place, uh, first meeting in February in March, product specs. And as we moved um, as of May with our technology partner after an RFI process uh, selected, we have started to built the minimum viable product and it will be ready one more iteration to go we're in the last iteration it will be ready beginning of august and uh, it's very exciting and i will show you today what it looks like because now the story comes to life and we can also much more specifically talk about further improvement cycles um, interest of the institutions or of the funders uh, but also other types of publications than uh, journals we're talking we've just started working groups on proceedings and books we're looking at the diamond model we're looking at china because the ambition is for this to be global and uh, uh, irrespective of publication type and, and business model um, that was uh, just at a glance. Now, in a, in a bit more detail, the underlying uh, problem, and, and I'm sure you know all this, but all these developments are actually bringing this challenge of complexity and administrative challenges because open access output is growing year on year. Increasingly, funders and institutions are paying for OA centrally. Business models become more complex, some with others without individual publication fees, uh, some through agreements with publishers, some through sponsorship models. And also the requirements about uh, how various research outputs should be published are expanding. And the bottom line of the practical problem is what we're addressing with the switchboard. And that is that for a specific publication, there's very likely to be multiple authors involved, each with multiple institutional affiliations and their own funder arrangements. And we, uh, we've come to call that multilateral publication level arrangements. And that is what the switchboard is all about because it's complex for all funders, institutions and publishers alike to implement that and to honor those multilateral publication level arrangements. As mentioned, this is because multiple authors involved and the institutional affiliations and the funder arrangements, but also the myriad of systems and processes with all these players involved, uh, it is, uh, enormous to, to deal with the different systems and, and processes. 
So the people who got together, and I should not take any credit for that, I was not involved, but I think the people who originally got together and thought about this and looked also at other industries and also in, in, into the past of, of our own uh, environment, they thought the answer to this specific problem, to this many-to-many -many problem, is an intermediary. Um, uh, in the middle, a central hub connecting parties and systems and streamlining in a neutral way the exchange of publication level OA related information. And what we're then talking about is data and information, but also very much standards. And that is nothing has nothing to do with technology. So when we were starting to build the MVP this year, actually the first weeks, months, we talked a lot about standards and types of information and ORCID and ROAR and Ringgold and what kind of fields would be mandatory and what you would want to know and what is nice to know. So standards is a big, big part and we're still in the middle of it, obviously. Then the infrastructure is the actual message hub and being able to send one message from one party to the other and routing it to the right place in an efficient way, um, relieving the, the participants, obviously, of knowing all the details about how a specific funder or institution would want to receive, uh, whether by email or in a webhook through an API. That is all the stuff that the OA switchboard takes care of when setting up the accounts. And the back office services, uh, think about reporting. I'll show you what that is all about. But if this functions, if these groups communicate with each other in a standard way through the switchboard, these messages can obviously be exported into reports. And I'll get to that in a minute also. Uh, fed directly into your own system. So there is no manual uh, processing, at least for this part of the information needed. So what is it all about? What is the value that the OA switchboard aims to bring? It's to smooth out processes. I, I can't say this enough. This is back office. Uh, we are not planning uh, an, an interface for researchers or authors ourselves. We're serving funders, institutions, and publishers, or their um, uh, strategic partners, their system uh, partners, who will, on their behalf, uh, very likely be the ones who are interacting uh, uh, with the switchboard. But it's all about doing things that we can do in an anti-competitive uh, way um, to bring efficiency, bring down transactional costs, and, and reduce overhead, and smooth out processes, making it more efficient. And that will bring clearer data and, and greater accountability and indirectly it will relieve the researchers and authors uh, from financial and administrative hassle. That is what it's all about. Now, how does it work practically? I already mentioned uh, standardized communication. So the switchboard is all about predefined a set of messages uh, between funders, institutions, and publishers, and the switchboard enables them to send them uh, automated, integrated, scalable. In the demo, I will I will show you a user interface, but um, uh, I'm almost uh, uh, yeah joking in all of these uh, presentations and meetings that I hope nobody will use the user interface because it's so much detail, and not all fields are mandatory, but still it is a hassle to fill out that form manually. But it is possible because maybe some people, some parties are not yet ready to work with an API and do it in an automated way. Also, to be quite honest, to give you a demo, it's impossible to show an API. It's easier uh, to show you a user interface. So we have it, but we always say we hope uh, people don't use it and are able to integrate it into their existing system so that this whole switchboard is truly behind the scenes facilitating the communication. Already mentioned, if these messages flow through, it enables real-time monitoring and tracking, as well as standardized reports on predicted committed OA spent and publication numbers and details, and that can feed into local solutions and systems. So for instance, we're talking to the people from JISC, but also um, other players, uh, consortium manager, knowledge unlatched, CCC, editorial manager, um, OJS, basically all the, the, the systems uh, uh, providers that, that are acting on behalf of a, a publisher, an institution, a funder, or multiple uh, parties, we're talking about uh, talking directly to the switchboard or feeding in the output of the switchboard directly into their system so that that doesn't have to be done manually. And indirectly, I have a visual on this, um, integrate with 
your systems, the funders, institutions, and publishers, uh, so that behind the scenes, uh, uh, the OA switchboard can enhance uh, the services, again, in a neutral way and not having any interface uh, for researchers ourselves. Now, uh, even a little bit more detail, uh, three slides on how it works. So the communication and the MVP means minimum viable product and it truly is minimum um, because of uh, budget limitations but also because we wanted to get it out as quickly as possible and to be able to show it and get feedback uh, the, the MVP is minimum and it basically means we only cover two messages a so-called eligibility inquiry and a publication payment settlement notification message and both these messages in the MVP initiate from the publisher. There's an important footnote here that ultimately moving forward we want to see if there's uh, the desire once we have this hub in place uh, for for instance specific mes messages to be initiated from the funder or the institution and, and go the other way around. Um, what is also important that no prior agreement, so it is not necessary, we can deal with it, but it is not necessary to have a read and publish or a transformative agreement in place to communicate between the publisher and say the institution. And then the concept is pretty straightforward. The publisher sends a standardized message, an eligibility inquiry or a publication notification. The switchboard makes sure that it gets delivered to the right place. An answer can be sent and we'll make sure that it gets delivered. And as I already said, API is a recommended uh, means to do the communication, but we have a user interface and there is also a notification and alert by email if, uh, if that is desired. Then two, the insight and overview, the reporting, the monitoring. If these messages get exchanged, you enable uh, or standardized reporting is, is possible again various ways in the user interface it is possible real-time monitoring and tracking downloads i'll show that in one of the demos excel sheets but also json uh, format can be exported from the switchboard or ultimately feeding it directly into local systems and solutions and not even touching it uh, by hand and third, this is uh, where the switchboard behind the scenes uh, can enhance author researcher facing tools. So on the publisher side, imagine a submission uh, uh, portal or the, the a services portal or the content platform behind the scenes, those uh, uh, tools, researcher facing tools, author facing tools can talk with the switchboards to provide additional uh, information or to answer any questions there may be. And likewise on the institutional funder side, um, for instance the journal checker tool, we're exploring how that can be, uh, uh, how we can talk to each other and enhance the journal checker tool who obviously has an interface, will have an interface for the researcher, but also um, universities having their own uh, researcher uh, support portal or funders having grant application tools. Um, you can just imagine through API that certain questions can be uh, uh, exchanged, information being exchanged and uh, uh, better service being provided. Uh, the last slide before the demo and then David, I thought I'd pause for a minute, see if there's any questions. I think there's a lot of questions. The last slide before the demo, uh, the MVP uh, technical and, and bear with me because normally uh, our tech provider does this bit of the, of the presentation. Uh, the MVP basically consists of this core message hub and then a message data store. It's operated via API, also available via UI. You see that on the left hand side, so it's a choice, but underneath even or also the UI is actually operating on the API. So that is the heart of, uh, of, of the switchboard. Um, it's uh, uh, almost all, it's all open, uh, open source. Um, also the documentation, all the code, uh, the message structure, including validation schemes and examples, and the API are available via an open Bitbucket repository. And if you go there now, um, you can, see everything um, uh, that is listed here. Um, uh, latest edition is uh, configurable uh, notifications, um, uh, actually configurable validation, the notifications were always there. So depending on uh, uh, what is used, um, uh, email alerts and, and webhooks uh, will be uh, sent to notify that there are messages to, to act on.
I think I should uh, pause here for a minute, David, see if there's any questions you want me to address at this point. Oh, you're Sorry. muted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, most, of the, most of the questions have actually been some technical ones with some problems um, with ah. um, people being able to hear. But uh, Manuela uh, Palotto has, has asked about the main difference between the API and the API of platforms such as Dimensions. Um, I'm not familiar myself with Dimensions. I don't know if, if that's something you... Yeah, I can say something about that. This... Um, what is unique about the OA switchboard is that it all happens super early in the publication process. So these messages, the eligibility inquiry and the publication notification, is, uh, definitely the eligibility inquiry happens way before publication because the eligibility inquiry is a message from the publisher to the institution or the funder about an article which is not yet published. And the question there is, does this intended publication have the potential to meet your requirements and would you have central funding available to pay for any applicable publication charges and the second one the notification and and we're finding out in the pilot at what point in time it's sent but it's either at acceptance or otherwise at publication so really the minute before or after publication it is a notification message from the publisher to the relevant institution or funder with all metadata, the DOI now included, and, and information about how the bill will be settled or which deal it will be charged against. So um, I am talking to uh, uh, people from digital science, but also from any other uh, uh, parties who have services later in the process flow that possibly, possibly, and here comes this one into play again. Uh, information from the switchboard could f feed into uh, these services. But um, I should say at this point that the OA switchboard is not a, a database or a tool that uh, fantastic analytics tools or additional services can be built on top for a standalone commercial purpose. Let me clarify that right away. This is a back office communication tool between publishers, funders, and institutions. So if there's any commercially or privacy sensitive information, uh, we will deal with that in a secure way. And it could very well be that that is it. It's behind the scenes, it's between those parties and it, it never, never goes out. And the reporting that I was talking about go into the systems of the funders and institutions, but don't make it into uh, third party systems at all. Okay. I hope that and, clarifies, yeah. And then there was a, there was a follow up on the API is, as, as to, is it an enriched model or modeled as a graph? Sounds like a technical question about the API. I can't answer that. I need to take that to my tech guy. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. So we'll, we'll follow up on that. Yeah, and, uh, definitely. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, but that was, that was it. Thanks. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Let me check how we're doing on time. I think we're good. Then I suggest I just move on to the demo, to the demos. Um, this is an overview um, and uh, let me say at this point again this what we're building is a minimum viable product on a on a on a uh, 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 how do you say it? limited budget and also we are in iteration five at the moment so the demonstration videos that I will be showing are from intermediate deliveries and by every step with every demo with every iteration we've been um, collecting feedback talking to pilot users and improving as we move along so you'll see in the demo some some glitches uh, so bear with us but um, after the beginning of August when the MVP is delivered for all these key features we will make nice and clean demo videos because these are the key features of the OA switchboard MVP it's compose an eligibility inquiry, both in case there is a prior agreement in place and in case there's no prior agreement in place, compose this publication payment settlement notification message, same for the same two scenarios, then resend because maybe you didn't get a response and you want to resend the same message or following an eligibility inquiry, you now want to compose a publication notification message and you don't want to enter all the same information manually again so you can uh, work from a pre-populated sheet. Then obviously the ones who get the messages have the opportunity to read them and respond. Then the monitoring and the reporting, real-time export API, and this is on predicted and committed OA spent publication numbers and details. Then the routing 
and I should say at this point in MVP, we're using the ROAR identifier, uh, the registry to um, uh, 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 make sure that the message gets delivered to the right recipient and, and I'll show that to you. And there's auto suggest, I also have a demo on that. And last uh, delivered, last week in iteration five is custom validation and, and auto reject based on master data. Uh, of central OA fund terms. Like for instance, journal has to be in the DOAJ or the APC cannot be above 1500 euro. I'm just making it up. But if these terms are pretty firm and fixed, we can uh, uh, include those as master data for an institution in our configuration and, and based on that actually auto um, answer the eligibility inquiries. Now the demonstration videos, I have them here embedded in the PowerPoint, but they're also available from our website. Uh, as I said, moving forward with each and every intermediate delivery, we're making improvements, we're adding functionality. All the videos are on our website, but today I will show you number 4.2, 4.5 and 5.3. So the first one is quite straightforward, compose an eligibility inquiry message without a sorry, prior agreement in place. And in the test environment, the sandbox environments that you're looking at, it will be Hindawi uh, who are sending a message to the University of Amsterdam. And this is obviously all fake. This is just uh, the test accounts that we're, uh, that we're using. So what you'll see in a minute is the dashboard for Hindawi. And in the next video, I'll show you the dashboard for the University of Amsterdam, but it looks very similar. So look in the top right corner, you see whose role we're watching. So Hindawi, and they can compose a message, an eligibility inquiry or a publication notification message. In this case, an eligibility inquiry. So obviously if you use the API, this doesn't need to have to be done manually. Um, at institutions, this is where in the user interface, there is the integration with the ROAR registry. So you'll get suggestions to pick the affiliation. Obviously, article title is a mandatory field. Whether the article will be published in an open access journal or a hybrid journal under which license is mandatory. The journal title needs to be filled in. Journal ID is ISSN. And then the switch prior agreement, yes, no. In this case, no. And that means all the details on the APCs and other charges and discounts is uh, to be filled out. Uh, at this stage with an eligibility inquiry, it can be that the APC is not yet firm, that it's an estimate. Um, the type of APC is, is uh, indicated, also the amount. Then based on feedback from our pilot users, we've identified 16 different, 16, one, six, uh, different charges and discount. So for instance, membership, society membership discount or uh, extra charges for speed of publication. Uh, all these amounts can be filled out. And in the answer to this eligibility inquiry, the University of Amsterdam can indicate line by line if they accept it or in full or partial. Now here, I want to stop quickly because the send to, um, in this case Hindawi, this message, the eligibility inquiry can only be sent to a party, an affiliation, a university or a funder that bears a relationship to this manuscript. So if uh, only the University of Amsterdam is here in this form, then this message can only be sent to Amsterdam. If, and you'll see that in a later demo, if also the Gates Foundation has provided funding or there's also another university involved, here the uh, publisher needs to choose who to send it to. Obviously, the same message can be sent in parallel or sequentially to multiple recipients but it can never be sent to a party that bears no relation to the uh, manuscript, to the submission. And here, somewhere in this dashboard now, this message, I think it's the second one, uh, appears. Uh, and E1 is this eligibility inquiry from the publisher to the University of Amsterdam. And at the moment, it is awaiting the response from the University of Amsterdam. Here you see arrows, and that means 
that there is follow-up messages. This E1 that you see here has a, a green tick and it doesn't say awaiting response. It basically means that it has been responded to. If you would click on these messages, you zoom into uh, the actual message and get all the detail. So this is pull down arrows. If you would click on that, um, I can't do that here. It's a screenshot. Um, you can see all the underlying messages that are related to the one that uh, we sent. Okay, the filtering and the reporting, I'm going to show to you from the point of view of the University of Amsterdam, and I will show in one video the reporting, which is exporting files, and the filtering, which is on screen. So top right corner, you see University of Amsterdam. They will not compose a message, they will go to reporting, here is a number of criteria that can be uh, picked, whether only eligibility inquiries with related messages or only publication notification. You can indicate as a university for which publishers you want to get the report, also the time period, also various other things. Again, we get continuous feedback on what to do here. And then the export nowadays is both possible in Excel and in JSON. After this video, I'll show you simply how the Excel file looks like, but left bottom corner, that is where your export, the Excel, will appear. It's as simple as that. Basically, all the data fields in the messages can be exported. Now, the filtering, top right corner, that is on the screen, real time. If you just want to have a quick glance, this one has improved in the meantime as well. You pick from Hindawi to the University of Amsterdam for a certain time period. Um, the results will be displayed on the screen. And by now, and this is a version from the beginning of this uh, month, but by now, here you see 7,312, the sum of the money per currency. We will now also show the separate currency. So if hypothetically um, uh, Hindawi has sent eligibility inquiries or publication notification messages for say euros as well as Canadian dollars um, and also the amounts uh, separated for the P messages and the E messages, you get a number of lines where you currently see here sum of money um, that will be uh, shown and it just gives you a quick glance. Obviously you can get the same if you do an export get the Excel and play around yourself. This is just a quick way in a certain time period, maybe for a certain publisher, that you want to see how much did I commit to, how many of these eligibility inquiry messages did I, uh, uh, did I approve. I think that's the end. Yeah, of this video. And then the export, the Excel, it is just a huge, huge file. Um, um, there's more details now uh, already in a new version. Uh, basically what we've done also with uh, um, input from, uh, from Ruth and from, from other pilot users is check all these data fields against uh, lessons learned and recommendations and, and templates from, from other projects and from other purposes to be sure that uh, we export everything, but obviously also that we have all the data fields in the messages because it, that's what it all comes back to, the standards of the messages and, and the, the, the message structures, but whatever we have in, you can report on. Now the last demo, let me check, yeah, I think we're doing fine on time. The auto-suggest or auto-reject, uh, with the iteration five, we have um, enabled the, the, the functionality to keep master data on central OA funds in the switchboard. And what does that mean? Say, if the University of Amsterdam has a central OA fund, uh, but it's only available to gold, journals, called OA journals, and the journal has to be in the DOAJ, and the APC amount should not be more than 1500 euro, and um, Amsterdam never picks up uh, additional charges, like color charges or whatever. Again, any of these fields, if, if we can um, identify them discreetly in the, in the form and, and in the funding, uh, sorry, in the central fund policy, it can be uh, configured, and we've done that so that the uh, eligibility inquiry can get an automatic answer. And in this next video, I'll show a basic 
basic functionality of that. So here we are, Hindawi again, the publisher creates an eligibility inquiry, enters author name, and in this case, we're going to add multiple institutions for that one author. And we've configured different uh, master data on the central OA funds of the University of Amsterdam, the University of Exeter. And this is all um, just testing and uh, uh, this is not real. Leiden University are all in there. So the mandatory fields and uh, as part of the pilot which is ongoing as we speak we're working with the funders and the institutions to find out what are exactly the mandatory fields that they really need as a minimum to be able to answer the, the question of whether the publication has the potential to meet the requirements and whether central funding is available. We have to go through the motions again put in the APC. Type of APC. Firm or estimate and an amount. And now we get to And I'm going to pause here because now, and we're working on the indicator, so apologies for the visually impaired or the colorblind, but there's three different colors here. The University of Amsterdam has a green dot, Exeter has an orange one, and Leiden has a red one. And this is an auto suggest because we know that the University of Amsterdam is a participant in the switchboard, and they've also indicated when we set up their account, they have a central OA fund. So it's a good idea to send this message to Amsterdam. Exeter, for the purpose of this, for this demo, uh, are orange, and they have an account in the OA switchboard, so you can send the message. Actually, it will be delivered if you choose to do so, but Exeter has indicated they do not have a central OA fund which I know in reality isn't true, but again, just for the purpose of this demo, then it's maybe not a good idea to send it because they have informed us that there is no central OA fund. Now Leiden, we don't know because they don't have an account in the switchboard, uh, so we have no idea. It's a red dot. Um, it will be uh, coming back to you if you're Hindawi and you're still trying to send this message as an undeliverable message. So you get it in your dashboard, but it will never be delivered. I already mentioned the issue of privacy and, and maybe commercially sensitive information, uh, especially if there are read and publish agreements and transformative agreements. Um, one needs to have a contract in which we deal with this privacy issue and confidentiality uh, when we set up an account. So there is no way that people can just go in the switchboard and play around to get information. You have to set up an account and uh, comply with the, uh, yeah, the, the relevant levels of, uh, of security. Good. And this is the uh, auto suggest functionality. I can't show you now, but it is live in the meantime, the uh, the auto reject. So if we had put in here, um, uh, I don't know what it is, well, 1500, um, uh, actually we have configured Amsterdam uh, that the journal has to be in the DOAJ. If you don't and you push send, um, it, uh, it will come back and you will get the message auto reject because it doesn't meet the requirements of the recipient. Okay. I think we're doing fine on time, David. I've tried to speed, <laughs> speed up. Um, this was what I could show you. Um, I think I should just open up and see if there's any questions or discussion. Yeah, no, no, there certainly are. Thank you. That, was, um, that seemed to be really clear. So uh, just a couple starting from me and then I'll go through the questions. So every each institution would have a, a single contact person or, or, or who would set up an, uh, an account with the switchboard and yes. then would enter the, these these details that you've just been describing. Yes. Um, okay, so that would be done centrally. Okay. Yeah. Um, question about how that works for publish and read deals where there's no individual APC transactions handled by the institution so I guess like for the UK has an agreement with Springer um, how, how, how would that work 
Right. Um, yeah, I, I didn't show you a demo, but it is on the on the website. Um, uh, we do not keep details on the content of the read and publish agreement. So uh, the most basic eligibility inquiry. So number two, the uh, sorry, number one, compose an eligibility inquiry in case there is a prior agreement is the simple question. Here we have this author. These are the journal details. And um, uh, this is the name of, of the deal. Uh, say, I don't know, uh, um, RL UK and, and, and Springer in this example. And um, do you agree that this uh, article is covered under your agreement without any financial details? That is the most basic form. It's um, what people now, I think, already do either by email or in other formats. It's a validation. Uh, we're going to charge this article under under our existing deal. Do you agree? Okay. Now, what we have added on the request of some uh, uh, very engaged pilot users is that it is possible, uh, because apparently that is sometimes uh, relevant, that even if there is a prior agreement in place, there is still something to be uh, confirmed around the finances. So exactly all the data fields around APC and everything I've shown you around APC and also additional charges and discount, we have that as a second step in the prior agreement uh, functionality and then there is the choice we do need to specify financial details yes or no but what we don't do maybe just to really clarify anything that's in your contract we don't um, maintain or host that in the in the switchboard it's just to check against what you have in place and getting a yes or a no okay the, um I, it was Anna who, who asked that question. I don't know, Anna, if that's, if you want to, it's an indicating chat if that's sort of, if that's answered or if you have a follow-up um, to that. Um, what we can do uh, while we will do that is, um, in the chat actually, there's a question um, about, um, um, oh, okay, Anna is responding, yes, but interesting if there's a cap. Uh, e.g. with Wiley, is that a cap in the, is in the total number of, um, can, we, can we put Anna on, um, can we make Anna not mute? Um, and then uh, maybe she could ask the question directly rather than have me try to interpret it. Um, <laughs> okay, no, no. can you hear me? Well, yes, we can, Anna, thank right, you. Right. No, yeah. so, so with Wiley, you've, um, we've got a deal there as well, but there's obviously a cap on the amount of of articles we can publish across the UK. And also interestingly, there's some discussion on which type of publications are eligible or not. But presumably these things can be worked through in terms of the criteria and what's recorded in the dashboard. Yeah, I would, I would think so. Definitely the type of article I didn't show you, but there is a field uh, next to article title. There is also article type. So we've taken the what is it? I forgot. I, there is an industry standard of, I think, 31 article types. Uh, so, yes. Co -op, co -op, yeah, I think so. Yeah. 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 So, we try to work in general as much as possible with existing standards okay. and lists and pull downs. So, yes, there is a field for article type, and, and um, that is one. And then the, the cap. Yeah, I think I'm thinking out loud mm -hmm. now. Yeah, I think if. Um, yeah, that could be in a master data, right? I mean. Uh, uh, well, the cap is UK wide, so oh, it's interesting how that that's would work. Yeah, <laughs> that is interesting. I well, think this is that... why we don't want caps at all, you see, but that's ah. another discussion. Okay, let's take that okay. offline because that I indeed don't immediately see how we would do that for you. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's fine. Thanks, Yvonne. No. Um, Staying in chat just for a moment, uh, Jane was asking about uh, any plans to integrate the switchboard with JISC Monitor. Yes, talking to them. Like I mentioned, we talk to many people. We are uh, uh, talking uh, with uh, Frank Minista and his team uh, to uh, do exactly that. So that the reporting that I was showing, the E1, the P1 messages would be feeding, or it would be possible to feed those straight into, if you have a, a JISC monitor uh, uh, local, I think it is. Sorry for not knowing the details, but yes, definitely. Okay, thank you. And, and, I, and I noticed that Liam Ernie is on your steering committee. Definitely. Um, so yeah. there's obviously a, a very strong connection there with yep. this and, uh, and some of those. Then back to uh, the Q&A. So Manuela is asking about um, interlinking publications to research data. 
um, at some stage, possibly post-publication? Yeah, at the moment, uh, because we know it's a requirement from some of the funders, we have a field that uh, with the publication, the research data will be deposited uh, somewhere or at the PMC or, or uh, somewhere, um, uh, because we know that that is a, a condition for uh, picking up the APC bill. Um, no further details yet. Uh, we haven't explored it, but um, as, yeah, could be. Okay, and then uh, there was a, a, a second part to this, which was uh, considering including the switchboard API, uh, making it also actionable and interoperable DMPs. And, and we may need to get Manuela on because I'm not entirely sure. Um, if, if Manuela's there, could you, do you want to sort of like expand on the question a bit, unless Yvonne knew? I don't know what DMPs, maybe I do know, but I don't immediately recognize DMPs. Can we get um, can we get Manuela to uh, data management plans? Okay. Oh, okay. So inter integrating with data management plans. Could you elaborate a bit on what that would mean? Oh, she's not able to unmute herself. Let me see if I can do it, or maybe um, we might have to ask Mel. Mel can do it for us. Okay. And I've, I've unmuted, so uh, Manuela, if you turn on your mic, you should be able to speak. Yes, hello. Hi. Thank hi. you. Hi. Hi. I did not notice um, the message that was uh, allowing me to unmute myself. Um, I was just wondering, in case, uh, as I was asking, also research data was going to be integrated in the APIs, which seems to be, uh, that could be a possibility eventually, whether, um, especially from the funder's point of view, also DMPs, which are documents written by the researchers at bidding stage, um, to compare ah. the, the, um, the requirements of the funders, uh, whether these documents, which at the moment uh, um, are being uh, given some PIDs, some DOIs, um, in general, as a standard that is uh, becoming a bit more implemented, whether those two will be integrated in the APIs as uh, um, documents uh, supporting, in a way, um, the research data as well. I hope it makes sense. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense. <laughs> or sorry, I, I, I think I understand what you what you mean. Um, what we have, and, and maybe let me just quickly start that uh, that video again. Uh, you might see on the screen that there is a, a funder name, a grant ID, and grant name. We haven't done much with those fields yet, but like we have with the ROAR integration with the institutions, um, uh, I can imagine, and we still need to talk to Crossref, that there is something, I think I should pause here uh, for you to sh see it. Uh, oh, hold on. Anyway, um, uh, what we haven't done yet, we have a field for funder for grant name and grant ID. And I'm, I'm aware of what you're saying that more and more of these grant documents get a DOI. And I also know that Crossref is doing something in that space. And I'll, I'll be talking with Ed Pence later this week. And also Jeffrey Builder is our is a, one of our technical advisors. And Brian Vickery is on our advisory group. So um, we should look into that if, if, if that can somehow be uh, integrated, if that is what you mean. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, can I just ask you something as well? I was going to write it, but maybe I can just ask you since I am talking. Yeah. To you. Yes, please. <laughs> can I ask you whether you will add in the metadata fields also the 14 credit roles, which are yes. just accredited with me, so for the authors, uh, for the various authors' roles? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's in already, actually. It's not a mandatory. I should probably just have this video keep on running, running, because you see credit in the third row. And again, the 14 ones standard have, uh, are in there as a, as a pick list. So uh, credit is there. Uh, now at the bottom, you see funders, grant name, grant ID. Um, and, and yeah, this is perfect questions and, and feedback. This is exactly what's happening with our pilot users all the time. We show the demos, uh, we talk about it, and we get these kind of questions, and we look at what is reasonable, and, and some things are easy to fix in the next iteration, and some things we just need to park for continuous uh, 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 improvement cycles. So thank you. Yeah. 
and um, and Anna has asked a sort of a follow up question about there around the, the the grants and the grant IDs and and can you can you actually allow multiple grants to be linked to a single publication? Yeah, definitely. Uh, what we've chosen now, because it already got so full and complex as a form, but technically there is no issue whatsoever. We currently have done the funder, the grant name and the grant ID at manuscript level, but it's ever so easy to pull that up to the um, uh, author level um, and also to, uh, like we have with, um, you see here, the. Uh, um, uh, at other for fees and uh, 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 other charges and discounts uh, the same we could do for grant um, we just simply haven't done it yet okay um, I think we've ex exhausted the, the questions both in the Q&A and in the chat um, I don't I, I should have checked with you before um, um, but I, I don't know if you're going to say a few words about what's next in terms of you know, the, the, the uh, um, MVP will be um, launched in August, I think you said. Yeah. And what, what can this group, what can the participants who are on this webinar today, what, what would you like them to do? How can they get involved? What's the, you know, what's, what's the next stage there? Well, that's a really good question, David. Thank you. We, we at the moment have three uh, universities from the UK uh, as part of our pilot users, but we can absolutely uh, uh, manage more. Uh, so basically that means um, you get in touch with me. There is a very simple contract basically to agree that there's no money exchange and that we observe GDPR and, and that kind of stuff. Then you, in a day, um, our tech partner will set up an account for you and you can start playing around. Uh, that is one thing. And you can give us feedback uh, and as you see in the top continuous improvement cycles depending on our funding uh, we are still incorporating uh, feedback and uh, uh, improving as we as we go along another thing might be that there is a very specific topic maybe with a specific publisher we have those pairs uh, I can't name names but there mm -hmm. are some publishers and institutions who have indeed uh, contracts and who have a, a glitch in their current workflow and they are now as we speak you using this sandbox environment to iron it out or to see if, if we can, with the switchboard, make it easier for them compared to what they're doing today. So that could be a second thing. If you have something very specific that you want to test uh, yourself, um, uh, we can uh, provide it. There is maybe a matching publisher that might be the requirement. Uh, we, can, we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we move on, a completely different topic, uh, but we are starting to think about a pricing model for uh, 2021. And I already mentioned, uh, this is not for profit. Uh, this will work best if everybody uh, participates. Uh, the, the beauty there is that if, if all publishers, institutions, funders participate, the service will work best and we can uh, uh, lower the price. Basically, we can do it as, uh, as advantageous as, as possible, but we're cracking our heads on, on how to do the pricing so if there would be anybody in this group who wants to think along and we have some ideas of course we have ideas but but think along and give us feedback on how we can do this because also here we want to do it in a fair and transparent way we are going to be we are we are actually completely transparent on the finances of this project how much it costs uh, and how we're funding it but also moving forward we will be completely transparent on uh, on cost and, and pricing so yeah anybody who wants to think along on um, fair and transparent uh, pricing to uh, make this available as uh, as cost effective for everybody that would be great okay brilliant um the, the question about um, knowing who's involved in terms of publishers and funders. So I'm looking on the website at the moment. You've got some, you've got a list of contributors and sponsors. Uh, yeah. But you know, is there, you know, if we if, if we were thinking, oh, we have a problem with publisher X, um, how would we know, um, or would we just write to you? You write to me. Okay. Because to be entirely frank, uh, this is indeed so far one of the things, and OSPA doesn't like it, let me be clear about that, that uh, we have not yet uh, disclosed the, the pilot users, but some, to be honest, were keen to test it out, but it was way too early for them to openly uh, uh, support the OA switchboard. So that is honestly the only reason why uh, the, the pilot users are not listed. Okay. All right. Um, uh, that's right. And then one, one, one final question just come in about modeling um, the um, uh, how things might be affected by, you know, how Plan S changes, how, you know, transformative agreements and such like change. I mean, is a is is the switchboard almost independent of 
of those models? Yeah, because we aim to be global and and uh, and, and neutral and and everywhere. Um, uh, but but of course, uh, if there is a, a, a yeah, the same with what was mentioned about the the grant uh, IDs. If, if uh, Crossref is the one who uh, who is uh, keeping a registry of of DOIs and what have you, it it makes sense to uh, enable that or facilitate that. Um, but we are independent of uh, of Coalition S, and we are, and that is one of our challenges. To be quite frank, we are serving publishers and funders and institutions. That's why I keep on saying we're back office, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it, it kind of boxes uh, uh, what we could do. But we could not do something that makes um, institutions unhappy because then none of you would participate, right? And we don't have a service. And the same with the uh, funders. So. Yeah, this is our balancing act. This is the this is what you deal with if you're uh, an intermediary, right? <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to keep everybody happy. Definitely, yeah. Which yeah. in a way, yeah, keeps it. Uh, we we yeah we can't get carried away with fancy dashboards and services because uh, that that possibly is likely to not serve all three equally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. That those are the questions. Um, can I hand over again to to, to Ruth, um, who I think um, is going to um, take us to the close. Thank you. Uh, I'll be very very quick because we're we're uh, nearly up at the hour. So um, thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to to Yvonne for for the webinar for answering all the questions. Um, I am as uh, as those people that know me ever an optimist in these areas so um, I'm hopeful that we can get this working um, but uh, as Yvonne said if you if you want to take part and will have any questions I think she is the best person to to contact um, you're welcome to get in, 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 in contact with me if you if you want anything passed on and just quickly also to note I did put it in the chat but um, I did have a conversation with Frank um, just a couple of weeks ago and just more sure are really interested uh, so they are talking as well um, if there's anybody else you think that needs to um, to be involved, then uh, then do let Yvonne know. Um, but on that, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us.